<laughs> Is the on-site tool good enough for the chairs, or do we have to join the full session? Uh, this is why we put it under the new echo training. All right, you're going to be, you're going to be like that, all right? <laughs> you also want some advice you can It's not replying to me. Oh, new echo. Yeah, I'm joining. I'm just having a delay in the getting joining for some reason. One second, please. Hey all, we're just getting the Meet Echo session started and we'll be underway in a moment. I clicked on the materials, I think it's rough. Except you need to no no here here oh, no 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 it's you no this one yeah click no. select one you see the, the title then confirm thank you thanks sir. okay well welcome to ADD uh, I don't know what number of ADDs we've done but it's been a few. Good morning. I was just saying, I don't know how many ADDs we've done, but it's been a few, but welcome. So of course, this is an ITF meeting, so please be aware that this is managed under the rules of NoteWell. Uh, so we get the blue sheets right, and so you can uh, join the queue. For those in the room, please use the uh, QR code or log in through the local tool uh, and make your presence known. I'm Glenn Dean. I'm one of the co-chairs. This is David Lawrence, my other co-chair. We have the best area director of all the area directors. And here's our agenda for today. Uh, so we have two working group, uh, two documents in working group last call that we'll talk about. Uh, we have two draft presentations. We have some hackathon results. But before we do that, I mean, and we've already taken care of the scribe and all that kind of stuff. Have you got an announcement to make, sir? I don't know. Did three things happen? Oh, yes. Uh, we we um, have, have three official RFCs right now. 
And I thought it was going to go on the slide, so I forget the numbers, but it's like 97, 61, 2, and 3? 94, 94, 61, 2, and 3. <laughs> um, but well, well here. but uh, you know, well done. It's been an a, a awesome journey, and you know, all, it's not like we had you know early faces and later faces. We got all the same faces, and well done, guys. Uh, that's a real accomplishment. So congratulations. <laughs> so. Let's get it started. Uh, Eric, do you have any comments you want to make before we jump in? No. Perfect. Well, welcome. And any uh, bashes to the agenda that people would like to propose or put out? All right, then with that, our first one up will be DNS resolver information. Let me bring those slides up. Tiro, are you on the? Are you in the room? You're in the room, even better. <laughs> I didn't see you over there. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, Tiro from Nokia. A little closer. Yeah. Next slide, please. Yeah. Uh, the document has passed the working group last call, but uh, next slide. Uh, Tommy Jensen had raised uh, a, a good comment, I would say. I mean, that was overlooked right, with regard to DDR. Uh, that basically deals with an attack that uh, with GDR, the resolver info resource record type could be spoofed by an attacker. Uh, that attack is not possible with uh, GDR, uh, is only possible with GDR because we can't use DNSSEC there because uh, the CDN is not uh, unique. Uh, whereas that attack is not possible with DNR and the IP2 configuration for encrypted DNS. So we were discussing in the working group what is the best way to uh, fix that problem. Next slide. Yeah, so uh, a simple way we thought we could address that problem was to add a new SIG attribute. Uh, the signature will be calculated for all the fields within the resolver info. Uh, using the private key of the DLS certificate and the client has to validate that signature using the public key. So that gives the data origin authentication for resolver info, even if uh, DNSSEC is not being used. And the recommendation is uh, we only need the SIG attribute uh, for DDR. Next slide. And here, here you go. It's working. Thanks. Also, Tim does have a question, but he can hold it to the end. If you like. Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, yeah, one of the, uh, I think Ben had raised several good comments on the working group uh, mailing list that uh, it's not going to work in deployments where the TLS server and the DNS logic are separated. And yeah, that's a limitation that uh, if there is clear text traffic between the TLS terminator and DNS server, uh, it won't work, but it still goes against the zero trust security framework. Uh, there were some, some other observations that some of these attributes uh, cannot be validated by the client, whether the server is indeed uh, saying the right uh, information with regard to its resolver attributes or it's lying, right? But the biggest advantage of this mechanism is that you would still get data origin authentication to prove that the data has been generated by the resolver itself and not by an attacker. Uh, for some of the attributes like extension errors, the explicit tests can be done by the client. Uh, for instance, info URL is specifically for troubleshooting purposes only. It's not it's not used for selection or for uh, displaying that to the end user. And, and, and resolver info is quite flexible to be extended, so new attributes can be easily added, which can be attested or verified. Uh, so the various possible solutions were discussed in the working group to restrict resolver info to just DNR and other use cases, but not to use it with GDR. Uh, that basically significantly reduces the scope of the specification, and I don't, I, I don't think we should rule out GDR. Uh, the other suggestion is, hey, why not restrict that clients which have an out-of-band agreement with the server that comply with those claims, they only start uh, consuming these attributes, and otherwise they just reject that. I think that also goes against the entire discovery model that we are now piggybacking on an out-of-band agreement. Uh, moving the metadata to EDNS was 
came out of nowhere but yeah it has challenges that it would abandon the uh, advantages that dnssec is giving for uh, ddnr and other uh, iq2 mechanisms uh, the uh, the one, uh, last possible solution that was being discussed was uh, relax the rule of sig attribute from must to should and uh, so that if the client uh, does not support signature attribute then it has to rely on an out of band agreement i am just listing all the possible solutions that were discussed in the mailing list we still want to continue with uh, the current design of one uh, two seems relatively okay but i don't think we should exclude ddr or confine this draft uh, for agreements with ens server so i would I'd like to hear feedback from the working group yeah um the strange thing is i don't seem to have my queue management tools anywhere <clears throat> uh so we can at least just say tim if you can just unmute yourself yeah i'll, I'll do that sorry just a quick um nitpick for this and i apologize um you should run the nits tool i know that 94 62 and 63 have been published but um, both these documents of working group last call have like reference mismatches. And it's, it's kind of the stuff that easily gets, gets ADs really cranky when you submit these for publication. So just a heads up, right? Um, that's all I was going to say. And, and, you're, and you're, have you resolved all of um, Johan's um, DNS directorate comments? Yes, we have resolved all the comments. Cool. I didn't see that. Okay, thank you. That's it. I'll shut up. Okay, thank you, Ben. Uh, Tommy Jensen, as Shepard, we we did run the nits, and so as of Monday night, of course, we'll need to fix the references. But otherwise, the only nit that the tool produced was a reference to the older uh, expired draft for ResInfo, but we felt that it's historically valuable to have, um, and so there are no other nits currently. Thanks. Sorry, I forgot to join the queue. Um, Ray Vellis. Uh, Ben's up, please, Ray. Sorry? Ben, ben was up. Oh, sorry, Ben. <laughs> if you uh, can join. Hi. Um, okay. Hello? Hey, yeah, Ben. Yeah, now we got you. You're good to hi. go, Ben. So the, uh, there was a, I want to focus particularly on uh, one of the concerns that you raised a few slides back that the um, uh, that restricting ResInfo to use cases where there's an out of band indication that the that the server implements this policy would be too restrictive. This thank you. Um, yeah. No, I'm I'm sorry. It's a it's a this one. Uh, yeah, this one. Um, so I I just want to clarify that. My my objection here is that it is not that this is not that we we need to restrict ResInfo in this way, but that ResInfo is intrinsically restricted in this way. Um, that is, if you if you encounter a, a resolver that might be operated by an attacker, and you have that is you have no pre existing trust expectations with it, then its resinfo is of no use to you. So, uh, so th this limitation is intrinsically present, and that's why I think that basically this authentication design is wrong. It authenticates information that you know just uh, within the larger threat model just tells us like, oh, the attacker really did mean to attack us, uh, rather than actually preventing any of those attacks. Right. So. Uh, and yeah, I, I agree with that for the attributes which can be leveraged by the client for selection, but not for the troubleshooting and other kind of attributes, which are just for backend processing. So yes, out of band agreement does give me uh, validity that these claims are not false, but yes, you, you need to have that mechanism, but not for all the attributes is all that I'm saying. Okay, uh, that's a good clarification. Uh, in that case, I think that you know those other attributes that are not used for client uh, automated client decision making also don't need authentication in this way because they're only useful 
within closed systems that are not under attack. Yeah, for instance, if it's a troubleshooting URL, right? I mean, um, for my for an admin, IT admin to look into that URL itself, right? Uh, if it's authentic, it just it knows that hey, it's coming from an authentic source. But if it's invalid, it will just discard it, right? So the authentication is adding a value. It's it's. Uh, I don't think the attacker is going to make any profit by uh, uh, misbehaving or changing the information URL for troubleshooting purpose. But if you're doing it for the uh, uh, um, yes, he, the attacker is not going to gain much benefits by attacking those uh, other attributes. Right, but in the in the case where there isn't an attack, the signature isn't providing any value in those cases um, because the because the information there is is only being used by the IT professionals themselves who can under who are who are already presumptively not under attack here right so my conclusion is that again the the sig parameter is not needed here it's not delivering any value um and that we can just uh, get rid of it and and as i said before we can move if we really need if we really do need this level of a uh, of attack prevention it still isn't the right technical solution Yes. Uh, so can can we put it this way, right? For the current set of attributes that we have, which are used for client selection, automated selection, I think we have to rely on the out of band agreement. Uh, and for the other attributes, uh, in case if we define feature attributes which can be validated uh, by the client itself with some assertion or something, maybe the signature attribute may be required or may not be, but. Since the draft is exchangeable, we can get rid of the signature and move on with the out of band agreement. Does that work, uh, Ben? Ben, if you want to pop in and. Hey, uh, yeah. So I, I think that, you know, if I, I'm happy enough to say we'll, we'll just, you know, drop SIG and, uh, you know, discuss the effective resulting security properties. Sure. Uh, I, I think that that's probably the easiest way forward here. I do think that at some level, ResInfo is, maybe it's too late, but I think that ResInfo is sort of like misdesigned here, that basically we are using the zone contents to talk about the, res, uh, to, to talk about meta information about the resolver itself, even in cases where the resolver has no DNS identity, like the, the IP-based DDR case. And I think uh, in retrospect, there are, um, there are better ways like eDNS where you can actually have explicit meta information. Um, one thing that occurred to me, an, another layer of defense might be easier to easier to implement in the draft at this stage would be to say that ResInfo must appear in the authority section, uh, which I believe is not going to be influenced by, uh, you know, in, in an actual recursive resolver is not going to be influenced by upstream uh, authoritative servers. Thank you, Ben. Ray, please. Uh, yeah. Um, so having looked at the document from the expert RR review type review that I did, I'd still say that the IANA registration template is kind of messed up. Uh, it's not consistent. Um, and this is something that um, uh, Johan did bring up in his review. Uh, I'd suggest actually maybe the fix is to remove the second column where you talk about the data type because you're completely inconsistent about whether the data type, particularly for the error code, is a value or a list of values. So I would say, and for example, in the fourth one down, you have like a binary. Well, there's no such thing as a binary because it's a text. So I would think, I would say actually get rid of that second column and actually say in the description that it is you know, a base n encoded value or it's a comma separated list of decimal values and so forth. Sure. Tommy? That's the Tommy mic, by the way. Yeah. Only people named Tommy can use that mic. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good morning. Um, Tommy Polly from Apple. Um, so, yeah, I agree with Ben and the consensus you're coming to here, probably about not keeping SIG. One of the things I was originally going to say is if we did keep SIG, uh, you know, or in general, if we're adding 
crypto stuff like that. It'd be great to have a test vector in some appendix to help sure. people do that. Uh, not necessary if you remove it, so don't worry about that. But in the future, let's make sure to do that. Um, <clears throat> in the text, when we're referring to the constraints around DDR, um, I just wanted to check because there is a distinction between cases in DDR where we're coming from an address and when we're coming from a name, because there is DDR from right. name when you already have a name server, you just want to see what else it supports. And also in DDR between things where we're verifying and potentially ending up with a name that we do trust versus cases where it's just, you know, a, a, more opportunistic based on the fact that we had the same address being recognized. So I'm wondering in cases either where there is a name initially, like dns.google and I'm learning that it does do instead of just dot, can I do something better here? And also in cases of like you know, quad eight or quad one is what I'm starting with where I learn that it supports encrypted DNS, but I also now have a name that's in the certificate along with the public address. Does, does that let us get something better? Yes, from it gets us better uh, provided that the client goes and validates and checks that the name uh, that's there in the cert is again used for the querying the... Right, so like we could reissue the res, we, we could issue a res info query for that name. Name, which is in the cert. And then make sure it's in the cert and then we, okay. Yeah, that should work. Great. So as we were are, are reworking that language, um, it, it feels like yes, DDR where we're like and broad all about DDR. And let's yes, be very specific yes. on the cases. It just says like when you only have an address from DDR, then you're stuck. Yes. But otherwise, we're okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Yeah. I agree. <clears throat> okay. And so that was the end of the queue. But does our shepherd want to say anything more? Yeah, first of all, I want to clarify because I, I don't know if I quite followed. In the case where you're using name-based DDR, it's actually the same as the base case where you start with any other name. Yeah. In the case where you start with an IP address, the name that we end up with is not trustworthy. That was the, the security model we decided with on, yeah, yeah, come back. Because, but because the IP address is the trustworthy identity. That's what we use to, so what happens, um, this really is the Tommy microphone. Um, <laughs> what happens when the local attacker changes the name in the service binding response on port 53? The validation for the IP address will succeed because you're going to dns.google, you have this name chilling here, it didn't have to validate. And then the client will use it to issue other queries and the server won't know any better because you're just asking about some other name. Right, so absolutely correct that for the purposes of DDR, for understanding that this is a trustworthy designated resolver, what matters is the address matching. And I'm just wondering, I haven't fully thought this through because I was just thinking about this like 30 seconds ago. If in this case, we, you know, we start with quad eight, we get a record that says dns.google, we can't trust that for the purposes of designation. We then connect to that, the cert covers quad eight. It also covers dns.google. At that point, when we have a cert that matches what was in that, and we also trust the designation by address, can you just issue the res info query for dns.google to itself? Yes, I think that, that's some proposal we had long time back in the split horizon. So, yeah. In, uh, in DDR, what we were discussing about that is ish, because lots of services use different names based on what subset of functionality they provide, right? So you may have a a straight honest resolver, you might have an ad blocker resolver, you might have a filter, whatever. And so if you change that name and the, those servers have different properties, like say one's a privacy centric one that does QNA minimalization, but the base one doesn't, you can actually change the answer by changing the domain name, even though the IP, even though that cert validation will succeed if they claim both, like if you have a left star pattern, for example, but I agree that it's not as egregious as I think. Right. I, I think it's not necessarily like I, I could see that being like a functional issue. 
if someone who is using ResInfo is hosting many different resolvers and confusing people based on it, essentially. Um, so maybe that's, you know, again, a consideration to have in here that feels more like a functional recommendation of what to do if you run multiple servers on one, multiple sets of functionality on one server. So, so question here from the chairs. Um, this sounds like there is some real thinking and discussion being had on this particular topic. Do we need people to go sit alone in a room for an hour while here this week and hash this out in, in like in detail on paper and paper, pen, board, whatever, beer? The shepherd would love that because I think that we're this close. It feels like you're and this close, but it feels like you're not quite getting closure. Sure. And I, well, I was just going to say, it does feel like we're at the place where we need the clarity on this. This is going to lead to another shorter working group last call. Yeah. Right. So. And so it would be great if we could do that before we have to wait for the next. Okay. So you're good with that? Yes. You're good with that? Sounds great. And, and we got people in the queue, but th there's a working plan. Go ahead, Tim. Sorry. Yeah. Tim Wasinski. Um, Tommy Jensen's point about if you start with an IP address, the discovered name is not trustworthy. It's not very clear in reading section three of the document that's actually spelled out. Um, and unless I'm missing something when I'm reading it, um, that's a good point. I think we just need to call it out a little bit more either there or in the security sections kind of thing. Yeah, I agreed on that. Yeah. Yeah. That was it. Okay. And, and Ben, did you, are you covered now? He had been in the queue, but, and Tommy, your stale queue. Yeah. Nope, that's uh, oh, okay. Yeah, I can take my comment to the, to the mailing list. Okay, great. And uh, the last thing I wanted, I don't even know if the authors know this, but Mark Andrews has done an initial implementation based on the current spec in Bind 9 that he expects to be able to be, make public in December. Awesome. Um, but of course, he's going to have to take into account the last little bit of cleaning up we do. Um, sure. So, yes, yeah. awesome. Okay. We're done? Yes. Okay. Thanks, Jerry. I think I'll be present in the next one. Yeah, yeah. He's got more decks. <laughs> Can you do what the this is? Uh, the, uh, the split horizon? Yeah. That, that one will be fast. Yeah, yeah. Establishing local DNS. Yeah. Yes, next slide, please. You're in control. Okay, awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Working group last call was successful. I think we've received several comments, right? And one external comment from DHCP review, which was quite straightforward that uh, if, uh, especially with DHCP v4, uh, if there is a limitation that you can't exceed 255 octets in that case, long options mechanism need to be supported. So we just updated the draft to address that comment from DHCP. Um, yeah, and few other comments that we had received from the working group and all these issues are being tracked in GitHub. Uh, one of the issues was, hey, uh, if uh, the subdomains that's supposed to be claimed uh, are for the entire parent zone, then just use an asterisk symbol. So we just updated the draft for that. And that's just one example that we had added to make it clear. Uh, the other one was, I believe, from Michael Richardson. He was uh, He's raised a genuine comment with regard to uh, how would this be interoperable? What would be the hash algorithms that the client and the server would implement? So we are relying on the registry that's already there for message digest for DNS zones. Uh, as per the current registry, uh, 384, SHA-384 is a must and SHA-5 well is a should. So uh, in case if these algorithms get deprecated, we will just rely on the registry to uh, update. So that will uh, that way we don't have to rely on any new registry. Uh, yeah, the other slide, uh, the other one was uh, with regard to uh, internal domains to be kept in a child zone of the local domain hints advertised by the network. And that significantly reduces the frequency of changes to the verification record. So that's a recommendation in the draft. Uh, no change with regard to the protocol or anything. Uh, we have a section on DNS set clarifications. Uh, I have asked Ben to look into it and I believe he is gonna update it very soon. And uh, I think after that comment is addressed, uh, I think we have addressed all the issues that are there in GitHub and uh, we are ready to progress to the next stage. 
So, um, Eric, Mr. AD, do you think it's appropriate at this point? Would this be uh, time to send it over to, to the DNS directorate? Any others you'd like to have a review it? So, Eric, I think the ADD, AD, oh, it's amazing to say this. Um, yeah, first, as a chair, you can request an early review from any directorate. Of course. Uh, at any point of time. And the DNS directorate is pretty quick on this, typically. Uh, so, please do it. Yeah, why not? Okay. And I'm going to recommend that we get, at least get security and ops as the two obvious ones. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. You can start with it right now. Of course. Okay. Perfect. Is that last slide? Last slide. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Thanks. Thank you, Kieran. We are ahead of schedule. So. Why are you through? Don't you have another deck? No. How do you? Um, yeah, it's Tommy. Oh, yeah. yeah. All right, so um, it's been a bit, but we issued another update to the encrypted DNS server redirection draft. Not happy? No. Um, maybe it's because I took focus right now. Cool, ah, thanks. It, it controls my desktop, nice. <laughs> no, awesome. <laughs> Um, there are two major changes we made in the Dash O2. Um, one is to split the mechanism into two different modes of operation to help scope the different security concerns. And the other is um, a familiar conversation to take consideration for DDR discovered resolvers. Um, the required mode of operation that's core to the spec is called strict origin redirection. And it's pretty self-explanatory. If you, if a server returns a redirection response, the domain name of the destination has to be a perfect match for what you started with, always. And it doesn't matter how many times you follow a redirect chain. Um, and that will give people the threat model they were looking for. Um, we've taken a dependency on delegated credentials um, because the idea is there's, in the scenario where the server that's doing the redirection does not want to share its private key with the server it's redirecting to, say the CDN case. Um, delegated credentials can solve the problem without having to change names um, from the client's perspective. And so the text recommends using this with um, strict origin redirection. It isn't required, um, but that's the, the guidance. So the core requirement is you have to support strict origin. Um, delegated credentials is optional as a recommendation to implementers to say, if you have that threat model, this is the best solution to that. Um, the alternative is a mechanism we're calling overlapping origin redirection. This is what is available if, for whatever reason, you can't use delegated credentials. Um, one of the TLS libraries in your client server or a third party you're redirecting to simply doesn't support it. Um, rather than being a major blocker, um, you can use this mechanism where through redirection, every server has to be valid for the domain name that it referred from and the new name that it's being referred to by. So for example, um, if you're redirecting from global.dnsservice.example to local uh, DNS service dot example for some geo region, the destination you'll, you'll want to do a two step. If you don't want to, uh, distribute your private key across the world where you'll redirect from your any cast, which may only have, uh, the, the one cert, or maybe you can do one step where it has all the geo regions. And then on the redirection, you can give the new name, the local name and your, fir your first redirection will say will be valid for both where you have these interim servers. And so then you can switch names because it's valid for both names. Um, so you can validate based off the original name like you would in strict origin redirection. But then because it succeeded, you can say, and it's valid for this other name. And so now I'll use that as the identity. And now it can be redirecting within that geo region, even though that's not the name you started with. 
Um, and this is something that the implementer can do with the same, um, without having these extra TLS dependencies. This mode is optional. It has a different threat model, very obviously. And the text explicitly calls out the limitations on this and recommends, or I don't remember off the top of my head, but I'm pretty sure we even went so far as to require clients not to use this unless they have um, foreknowledge about it being appropriate for the server. I.e., this is not something that we're going to expect browsers or operating systems to do generally on the internet. It'll be something where you're managing your enterprise or you're working within your own networks. Love it when I read my own slides in advance. <laughs> and so just like every other case, because prior to this, we already specified that servers have to tolerate clients not redirecting. Um, that's up to client policy because it may want to terminate long chains, et cetera. Um, the same is true. A server can't expect clients to support overlapping origin, um, especially if they're facing the public internet. You can't expect general clients to support this. So it's a consideration. However, having this makes EDSR more flexible. Um, that way there is a standard answer for those that are in these special cases where delegated credentials isn't available to them, but they still want to do redirection. We have a standard answer as opposed to everyone doing some proprietary solution or heaven forbid, we have to publish parallel documents. Okay. So for DDR discovered resolvers and thank you to Tommy earlier, let's be specific that this is about IP discovered DDR resolvers. Um, the IP address is the identity. Um, we may want to revisit this after we have our little design discussion, but the current, uh, the current take by this draft is that because that's the identity, we support strict origin in, this, in the sense of the IP address, meaning that once you establish the encrypted DNS connection and then are redirected, the redirected to server needs to be able to claim the original IP address as well. And that's the equivalent strict origin. Um, there is no overlapping origin in that case. And that kind of makes sense because DDR from IP address is a general public thing. Um, when you manage your networks or like your endpoints on managed networks, you can do direct configuration. DDR from the IP address is a general internet story and we don't want people using overlapping in the general internet story anyway. So I um, want to open the discussion to make sure we can resolve the security concerns. Glad to see Ben's in queue um, because we'd like to move this to adoption. Um, there's a bunch of other things that are a little less concerning that we'd like to work through with the working group, but we don't want to block on those things. The security ones make sense though. Mr. Schwartz. Hi. So yeah, I think that the uh, I think that the overlapping origin thing is like very clever and like doesn't provide any easily described security properties, and I don't really see the appeal of it. Basically, like I understand the idea that like well, if you you, you know maybe we can put something in that isn't like really secure if we put a big warning label on top of it that says don't actually use this unless you don't actually need security. But that's a that's a pretty weird place for an IETF RFC to end up. And in this case, I really think it's unnecessary because as far as I can tell, the whole point of this is to defeat a set of attacks where an upstream attacker is able to execute a DNS cache poisoning attack and and put a different SVCB record into the resolver's cache to activate EDSR when the resolver didn't intend it. And just as with ResInfo, there are a bunch of easier solutions to this, like putting that redirection information in a channel that isn't subject to cache poisoning, like EDNS0, or maybe even the authority section. 
the authority section was definitely an interesting idea that I hadn't thought of or I missed in your emails from the last presentation. I, no, I didn't mention it. Okay. I, just, I thought of it later. Um, just, just to caveat though, um, I agree. The IETF should not be in the business of declaring here's the standard way to do something insecurely. But if you know in advance that you own a name and you're an enterprise, right? It's a little different than when you say, well, I trust give an open resolver. So I'll just always use this and it's my home laptop. Right. Um, so but in a private, in a private context where you somehow have foreknowledge of the additional trust properties of the systems you're connecting to, you don't actually need to specify this at all. Right. You can just basically say like, Oh, and you know, redirects that don't match the name are permissible by client policy. The nice thing about having the overlapping step though, is that the client may not know all of the delegate, like the destination names, you'll know all the origin names cause that's what you configure, but you spin up new geo regions, it department in whatever country decides they're going to rename everything after the building they're in or something stupid. Right. And but you can, easily enough imagine saying the 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 configuration policy of the system is that we start at this name and we also trust redirects to star dot that name or star dot some other name and so i got to redirect back it doesn't match the name so i wouldn't follow it automatically but uh it turns out that it matches my my special out of band configured policy so I move forward. It, it would definitely solve, it, it would skip a lot of steps that we might have to talk about if we could move to that in a draft. So I'm wondering if my co-authors want to get into the queue because um, they work with these scenarios more closely to see if that's acceptable. So well, may I also point out that, I mean, that's perfectly fine, but you know, the most efficient use of the working group time is, have them. is, yeah, I mean, if you guys have a debate, you know, talk about it offline. Okay, okay, um, never mind. Okay. Thank you, I, I think that, you know, in terms of adoption, I would say, you know, EDSR in strict mode is, is I think, squarely in focus for the working group. I would support adoption of, of that. And overlapping mode is sufficiently weird that uh, I would want to have that discussion separately. Cool. Mike. <clears throat> That's the Tommy Mike. Uh, no, that's, that's, also that's the mic mic. See, <laughs> well, it's Tommy and Mike. <laughs> so um, I just wanted to point out the similarity in your trust model here to alt surface in HTTP, where you get a different name to find the IP address and connect to, but you are still expecting the original authority to appear on the certificate when you get there. Um, I'm honestly not as interested in having the secondary name also appear on the new certificate. Like if it points you to another endpoint and says, that's also me and it has my cert. Okay, we're done. So the originating scenario behind this that didn't let us do that is the third party relationship, right? You contract out with a CDN. And so the destination actually, the final destination through a chain of redirections does not have your private key doesn't have the same private key, but it does have the private key for a cert for that name. Correct. For the same name. No, I, maybe I misunderstood your description of the, uh, of the overlapping model. But. Sure. sure. So let's say I have two names, a and B, because now I don't want to remember dot patterns. Um, okay. the client was configured through endpoint or whatever else to use server a. Mm -hmm. connects to server A, server A wants to redirect to server B, different okay. names, it's overloaded, um, it's been, uh, it identified the client is in a different continent, whatever. And it wants to send it over there because that entity doesn't have servers of its name control that can take the request at this time, but they have a, a legal relationship, even though they don't have a technical relationship with the destination. Okay. Now, delegated credentials is the obvious answer to the scenario. We all agree on that, okay. which is why it's, it's in there as the recommendation. Um, this mechanism was uh, 
an alternative that we were hoping would make adoption easier for those who don't have that throughout their ecosystem yet. Okay, but I'm waiting for the last sentence of that is of what is the client looking for on that cert when it connects? So um, as it goes in each, in each iterate, iterative step, anytime, if the name matches, all it's looking for is the name and it's just like strict. Right. If it's given a different name, then if it doesn't want to support this, it'll immediately fail. And if it does, it checks the destination for both A and B. And th that's why you have to have an intermediate redirection to switch names because the destination that has to be valid for A and B, and if it is, and you were told to go to B, then you can make B the current name and it can redirect to other instances of B as a strict. Ah, uh, I see. That's, that's the step I was missing that after you've been to somewhere that is both A and B, then you also trust B and you can redirect to somewhere that is only B. Yes. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. That, I probably could have done a better job on that. Tommy? Going up to the Tommy Mike Mike. Um, yes, I, I just wanted to get up to say that I think we should adopt this. I agree with the discussions we're having here from both Ben and Mike, but I would love to see those worked out as a working group document. Um, so I think it's an important area to solve, but at, at this point, the, the discussion seems mature enough. That, Let me just yeah, jump right in there. and say, yeah, because you're dancing around the question. Yes, we're going to put it out for right. adoption call. So <laughs> I, I think we can work out, we can work out these things after we've adopted because that's a good use of our time or, or convince ourselves that we're not adopting. <laughs> Why? I'm, I'm not presupposing, <laughs> but you and Ben got some stuff to work out. <laughs> yeah. Um, so then I guess if anyone, I, the queue is empty. If, if we have a couple minutes, I, I challenge if anyone wants to come to line and challenge the validity of the scenario, setting aside the solution. Because to Tommy's point, if the scenario is something we want to tackle, we can work on that together. Um, the scenario where delegated credentials is not end-to-end -end feasible but they still want to be able to do redirection to a contracted third party because we can change the solution. That's a scenario we're trying to hit so that this is more readily adoptable. And there's one solution that people are using instead of every vendor doing something unique, which is what a big part of what we try to prevent here. And we do have the time for that. We'll do one more document. Yeah. But and, and agenda scheduled time. We're good on. Hey, Hey. So, I, uh, I I think I'm supportive of this scenario. I do want to highlight to the group that it's a novel thing for the world of DNS, uh, where you're you're talking to a given resolver, and that resolver says, "No, don't talk to me. Talk to somebody else." In strict mode, they're not really, in our security view, saying that. They're saying, talk to a different instance of me. And when you talk to it, you'll confirm that it's still me. Um, that is just sort of a technical transport change. But in, in this other mode where we're talking to somebody who cannot prove that, uh, that they hold the same identity, who you know, in our sort of abstract terms is really not the same entity, um, then that's, a, that's quite a new idea. You talk to a DNS server and it says, no, use, use this other service operated by somebody else. Send your queries and trust the answers from this, uh, this totally separate party. As a security matter, I don't think that's a big deal. Um, I think that you know, basically the, the resolver could have forwarded our queries to that party anyway. Um, so I'm not too concerned from that angle. But I do think it raises some interesting questions about the user's expectations. Um, it's a kind of third party delegation that hasn't existed here before. Uh, and I, I, yeah, I think it's, it's fine. Uh, and overall, probably a, a good thing to support. But I don't think the overlapping origins is a good technical solution. And in terms of adoption, I would be pretty concerned about adopting the draft with overlapping origin uh, mode defined in, in the initial version. 
thank you for coming online. The reason I was trying to tease down to the scenario question is if the scenario is supported and the working group doesn't like what we have, it doesn't really matter if it's still there when we adopt because now we're beholden to the working group and we'll remove it with whatever it is we decide. Wow, look at that. <laughs> That's a pretty it awesome it transcription. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't, it, doesn't, it, doesn't, it, doesn't, it, doesn't, it just doesn't. doesn't. I, I repeat myself when under stress. I repeat myself when under stress. <laughs> At all. <laughs> Some AI transcribing is like, I know what Ben meant to say. Yeah. I got this. <laughs> okay, um, so we're good. If there's anything you want us to probe in terms of what people should want before doing a call for adoption? No, I, I think Okay, I, I, you're right in that once we adopt, if we adopt, that we can then go with the scalpel and take things out that the group doesn't like and add things into the group things really should be in that we've done that in the past we'll do that in the future so um yeah so i think we'll, we'll you know after we're done we'll put out the uh adoption call and you guys can argue on list for a while and then we'll adopt it or not cool thank you thank you tommy and tiru are you the presenter Yes. Uh, next slide, please. You, 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 oh, you sorry. <laughs> sorry. You just took it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This draft was presented in the last uh, working group meeting, and uh, we have addressed all the comments. Uh, basically, the main comment was uh, to add in delegation SVC parameter key. Uh, so what we have done is we have added uh, two modes of the parameter key. One is to say that if it's mandatory. Uh, that means to say that the DNS server is only accessible using delegated credentials. Uh, if it's not mandatory, then uh, DNS server has, it's, a, it's an optional authentication mode. So the client, uh, which does not support delegation credentials can still authenticate to the DNS server. But uh, if a client does not support delegation credentials, then uh, the mandatory effort will help it not to connect to it in the first place. Uh, yeah, that's just an example of uh, SVC parameter key. Uh, this was just given uh, assuming DNR in ADN only mode and then the client does a query to retrieve the uh, delegation information to sub decide whether it supports uh, delegation or not. And uh, yeah, so the scope of the draft was uh, we were planning to use it for managed uh, modern CPEs which can be upgraded and they already have support for encrypted DNS and we are working on deploying encrypted DNS forwarders on these home routers. Ben. Hi. Uh, I think that this is a cool idea and worth moving forward. I support it. Uh, I think it needs a new name. Uh, Service B is used in a lot of contexts where there is some kind of delegation involved. So. This needs to be very specific that it's about TLS delegated credentials. Sure. And uh, I think it needs to go through the TLS working group. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I'm not saying that it has to be adopted in the TLS working group, but it needs close review there. Uh, in particular, yeah. we, we should double check that it's really just a flag um, as opposed to something that actually ought to carry some parameters. This is not proposing any changes to the TLS. It's not proposing any TLS extensions. Yeah, but I agree we can get it reviewed from TLS working group. I didn't get the other comment. Uh, yes, I don't mean TLS extensions. I mean that the the service parameter that you defined right now is defined as a flag. That is, it's defined as a service parameter whose, whose parameter is empty. Right. Uh, and that seems to suffice for our current use case, but I would want to make sure that this is a general purpose parameter that suffices for all of the anticipated uses of TLS delegated, delegated credentials. So sure. I would want to check if there are any parameters that the TLS working group would want to inform a client about when they're deciding what to do with this. Okay, sure, we can check that. Are you referring to the recent work with regard to the TLS flags and the other discussion that were happening with regard to uh, 
the key shares that were supported by the client is that the one that you're referring to or something else that's happening in tls uh so not the tls flags uh not the tls flags extension but yes the for example that that recent discussion about key shares is is an interesting example uh you okay. know like for delegated credentials is there some expectation that uh that the client needs to know something about you know how long those delegated credentials are likely to exist or or potentially what key share algorithms are used in them i think probably not but uh i just would want to check yeah sure we should definitely check and, and then we should also address the if the client is going to make any decisions based on that what is the attack vectors that would be possible yeah we can do that and uh, i think we have addressed all the comments that uh, received so far and uh, yeah Oh, Tim, uh, Tim, Tim Wisinski. So is your, is your flag delegation space mandatory equals delegation? Is that your service B? So we have two options, right? One is if, if the DNS server can only be accessed using delegation credentials, then it will be a mandatory parameter. But as a transition, if the DNS server wants to support both the modes where it supports the uh, traditional uh, X, X.509 certificate and the delegation credentials, it can use it as a non-mandatory parameter. Because I, I, I wanted to go back and look at the service B registry and Ben and Mike are way more detailed oriented about, but I always thought it was key value stuff, right? So delegation by itself gets, gets me a little confused. So, but I'll, I, I can go take this off list and sort this out. So. It can be a flag. It you know it doesn't have okay. to be given the pair. Yeah. Okay, Eric. Um, Eric Niagara Akamai. It may be that if we want to go down this path, um, I, I could see there might be others of this like this in the future. It might be worth thinking of this as like a capabilities flag field rather than having one for each one of these. So, so instead of having just a delegation service parameter that's mandatory, have a capability service parameter that's mandatory that lists a set of things where delegation is one of them because that might make it more useful in the future. Um, but that would probably be something that would want to come out of either D go through DNS op or T um, TLS and just be used here. Yeah, OK, that could be considered. Okay. Uh, so do the authors think that this is ready for uh, an adoption call, or do you want to spend some more time? I think we're going to work on the comments that we got, but I think it's it looks if the problem is worth solving and we think this is a reasonable way of doing it, we can adapt and work on it. Okay, well, you let us know. And Tommy Jones just entered the queue. I uh, just want to say that there have been some drafts that come through this working group where I have an interest and they're refined to work well, but we don't have an implementation plan. But this would be amazing, and I'd love to see it adopted. You, you can't vote before we call, make the call, man. It's just it's getting ahead of things. <laughs> just kidding. You. Well, okay. What? All right. Is that everything? Yes. All right. Well, thank you. Um, we have one chair down. He, he, the, the, the... Wi Fi is gone away. <laughs> yeah. It's back, right back on okay. It just doesn't. It just doesn't. It doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's true. Maybe I check the start. <laughs> All right. We have one late addition to the queue hey, of back. slides that was requested. Um, I guess Chris is coming to the mic. I guess Chris is expecting you to talk about the mic. <laughs> Sorry about the title I made up for you, but uh, we can have that slide. That's fine. Hello. Um, so yes, uh, I thought, well, several of us thought it'd be a good idea to uh, um, see what we could do with DNR. Um, that question, maybe? Yeah. Yes. Um, so instantly that, that picture, um, uh, was, what? <laughs> yeah. So, so I would think, yes, yes. We had to pick one to try first, Eric. So we, so we picked the simpler version. So yeah, DHCP V4. 
It's okay. Who, who wants whoa, whoa, to whoa, do? Whoa, wait, wait, who wait, wait. The chairs, are, the chairs are getting in here. We we remain kind to each other in ADD. That's one of our <laughs> fundamental rules. Remember that back in the day. Why why start now? <laughs> so I apologize for violating the note well, right? <laughs> Don't tell my fellow ADD. Yes. So in this uh, V forward testing, um, oh, how did that happen? Um, so, yeah, in this testing, the uh, we set up this environment. So, uh, in place of um, a standard home router, we actually have a Raspberry Pi here. So that's broadcasting uh, a Wi-Fi uh, access point. So that's the 192.168, um, and, on, and it's got a wired connection to the IETF internet, which is the public address. Um, and we have the two test clients. So we have iOS and Windows. And so for the first thing we did was we tried using DNR to direct the client to um, what in this case was BT's trial dose service that was set up um, a couple of years ago. Um, so the, the clients uh, were both configured to request the DNR option um, and uh, DNS mask on the Pi was responded with those details. So it was directing the client to the, the, that IP address with that ADM. And that succeeded, so that the, both of them set up a doton, um, and obviously the, the Pi is not involved in, in those DNS queries. Now, um, as the next step, if we, so we, we looked at um, how do we include the router um, in that D DNS resolution process, so that it can then answer questions for the private names that it knows, um, and it can cache public names. So um, DNS dist was compiled for that with the relevant features. Um, so it was set up to provide a DOE listener on that Wi-Fi interface. Um, it was given two connections to uh, the backend DOE service, which is the two IP addresses of doe.bd.com. Um, it was told to health check the, both of those connections. Um, Given that this is going to be, yeah, conceptually, this could be distributed a lot. So um, health checked in lazy mode, um, which means it's not actively sending health checks every second. Um, it's, it's simply monitoring the, 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 uh, the queries that it's sending anyway. Um, and of course, it was told to implement a packet cache. So that looks like that. So we had. Um, both of the DO between the client and the and the router, and DO between the router and the upstream. So DNR was, of course had to be modified. So the DNR was then sending um, an ADN um, that pointed to to the uh, 192.168.1.254, which is the the uh, address that is listening on the LAN side. Um, so that all that works. So um, in all those cases, yes, DNR was, was successful. Encryption was used for those network segments um, between the user device and the recursive resolver. Any questions? I have one clarification question. Yes. It worked out of the box or worked after some tweaking? Um, obviously, we had to tell it what to do. Yeah. So okay. <laughs> you just... <laughs> I'm just... I'm very excited for how far we've come. So. Yeah, I mean, I mean, so you're asking in terms of the... Uh, yeah, any code so changes this, or any hacks you had to do to make it all happy in the end? Um, I, yeah, nothing, no significant bugs issue I've discovered. Um, I mean, obviously, I'm not counting the... the uh, the discussion we had previously about which which is the correct encoding of service params, which is, yeah. But. Andrea Schulzer, um, if you go back one slide, yeah, uh, the the DNR POC, uh, I expect for though there's some, some certificate in place. Yes. Um, who issued that certificate? Uh, that was Let's Encrypt. So. Uh, Okay, and personal domain is a public, public namespace yes, domain. Yes. Yes. So okay, 
um, I stumbled about the problem that personal domain is replaced in my case with a um, private namespace domain where I can't go to with encrypt because they don't issue a, a certificate in that case for private namespace. Yes. That's a... um, so I have to issue a certificate for, uh, from, from a private CA. Will that work too if the client knows the private CA issuing a certificate for that point? Um, I, well, Terry, did you want to respond? And Andreas, could you identify yourself? I don't know if you identified yourself with the mic so for the note takers. Uh, Andreas Schulze, Dativ, aus Germany. Thank you. <laughs> also known as Dami. No, not. Yeah, it's not going to work for private domain names or private CS unless it's an enterprise network where you have. Yeah, it won't work in, for uh, private CS or private domains, right? Unless it's an enterprise deployment where you have your enterprise CA installed on managed uh, laptops or managed mobile devices. What we have done in our deployment was at least uh, the initial beta was basically to get subdomains for each home net home device home network device, and then we were managing the CSRs from each home network coming to us, and we were talking to the CA to get uh, the certificates and then provisioning back to the home router. And that was the biggest challenge that we were facing. Like we had like millions of routers and there was a lot of piggybacking on the CA and uh, the cost and the maintenance was quite high. So that was one of the reasons we wanted to shift to the delegated credentials. So. Tell me. Yeah, Tira is correct for how that would work. Um, and then just to the question about was stuff tweaked, I just want to clarify um, for the iOS stuff, this was you know, very much in the spirit of the hackathon. The implementation was written while I was on the plane on Saturday, and then we tested it on Sunday. So absolutely some tweaks and bug fixes had to be made because it was very fresh code. Yeah, I wasn't trying to call anybody out there. My, my, where I was going with that is, is I think these things are fairly well done in, in, in terms of the specs and in terms of how to implement it. It's very, yeah. You guys really had a good handle on it. So that is like a crazy reach where we're finding weirdnesses that we didn't anticipate that. That's actually really clean. Yeah, right. right. And as a reflection to the spec, um, at, you know, at least for this DHCP before support, it was straightforward to implement and add into a system. And I'm glad that it was slightly before it got published as an RFC that we had done this full interrupt <laughs> testing. So, yay. Okay, anything else, Chris? Nope, that's it. All right then. Um, I think that's nope. it, unless anybody wants see. to bring you last minute business. Are, are you gonna bring last minute business? <laughs> no, but I can see Aditi in the queue. Oh, there he is. Okay, hi, I'm Aditi, uh, Microsoft. Um, so I can speak from um, Windows side. We do need to set one reg key to enable DNR, but other than that, it should work out of the box. It did, yeah. And yeah, thanks to you and your team for, for building that. Um, you know, we've come a long way. If you think back, we used to be arguing about could we trust DHCP or not? And uh, we've come to where we're, not, we're now like deep in the weeds and testing things. This is awesome. Um, so, And we got three RFCs, so. I'd like to point out one other way we've come a long way is you may recall when this whole ADD effort spun up, there was a lot of concern that this was going to be one of the most contentious working groups in the ITF and so on. Yeah, but you all, you all did a great cooperative job of getting three RFCs out and some more interesting work to come. So well done, working group. They said it couldn't be done, and you did it. Congrats. <laughs> All right. Well, that's it. Um, thank you. Well, we'll have a, we will expect on the list a couple of calls for working group adoption. Um, congrats again on the RFCs. Uh, we'll also look for you to kind of hammer out, um, you know, that res info bit where we'll probably have another uh, last call on that. So, uh, Actually, before everyone leaves, Eric, do you want us to do a quiz on Brisbane attendance or not? Okay. We'll, we'll do, if, if, you, if you take one second, we'll do a quick quiz. Some other working groups are asking people on their expectation, will they be in Brisbane or not? So let's do a quickie if I can make the tool work happily.
One second. So this is asking, will you be in Brisbane? Say yes if you will be. Say no if you don't expect to be. Or leave in the default state of no opinion if you don't know yet. And this can count both uh, in person and uh, remote participation. There's a pretty. It defaults to no opinion. If, if when, when you open up the, the, the thing, right. if you do nothing else, you get a no opinion vote. Yeah, we have a pretty sizable attendance though between on-site and remote. So. Okay, well, it's, it's settled out. 20 yes, 20, 11 no, and 30 undecided. Yeah. That's actually pretty good. It helps us plan for how big a room to select uh, for, for uh, 119. All right, then you really are free to go. Thank you very much. Thanks for the chat. Yeah. You, you can also do need to take into account that there may be people not voting because they have a hard time getting into your time zone. Right. And it would be more likely. It's just it's just a, a sense. It's not a hard. <laughs> All right. Well, if you said yes, you are. <laughs> well, when you first asked, I was not clear of it. Yes, it would have been But keep in mind, it's a grand tradition of the ITF when we do these things that we're ambiguous in what we mean when we ask the question. <laughs> well, if you want to be even more ambiguous, it's about this it gets. That if you're going to be present, hum, otherwise be silent, because that'll make it really clear. You're using some I guess I need to close that, or else we'll be in forever. Yeah, I don't know how we have to change sound. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it should work. Like, it should work. But the reason we do this is because our investments are generally not like. That's weird. Right. It should all just be two different things. However, then I don't see it all. I was aware. Do we have an official way to check? You were right about this contentious working group. Uh, you done correctly. Thanks to the room.